Urban patrol units in Jacmel, 80, and in Buenos Aires province, Argentina, are fighting the same cause, to put a stop to street violence. But that's not the only thing linking these two countries' police forces. They are both also bound by strict budgets, given the disastrous states of the economy in both countries. Faced with primarily poor and unemployed populations, these patrol units have to deal with the same types of crime, dangerous behavior, violent theft, an ever-increasing number of organized crime gangs, and of course, trafficking. The lack of funds puts these patrol units at a disadvantage against the heavily armed criminals. But despite everything, these men and women courageously pursue their mission, even if it means putting their lives on the line. Greater Buenos Aires includes Argentina's capital and its surrounding area. That's 13 million inhabitants, over a third of the country's total population. The economic collapse of Argentina in the early 2000s pushed 40% of the country's population into extreme poverty. On the outskirts of Buenos Aires, residential areas border favelas where criminals rank supreme. To address public concerns, the authorities launched a special police unit. Police officer duos like agents Ali Crizzo and Martin Roxel and Rocio Mateo and Pablo Zapata patrol these vulnerable areas day and night. Their mission, stamp out crime despite limited training and paltry funding. It's 7 a.m. At Tablada Station, Agent Crizzo and Roxel are beginning their shift. Here in Tablada, there are six cars. Lomas del Mirador has eight more, and San Justo has seven as well. Each zone has a station, cars, and mobile units on site. We constantly patrol these zones. There's always someone covering them. Buenos Aires Province Police Force covers the capital's surrounding area. It's a large area, and almost 40% of the country's entire police force works here. We work in a very high-risk area. Even when it seems quiet, it can become dangerous. It's happening increasingly often. We patrol in at-risk zones, red light districts, and the slums. No two days are the same. It might be quiet, it might not. Every day is different. No two days are the same. Always on the road, patrol officers are often the first on the scene at crimes and accidents on public roads. We received a 911 call about an accident at the intersection between Mendoza and Santa Maria. The mobile police unit was called out, and when they arrived, there was an injured person. So we've called an ambulance. The ambulance has just arrived, and the injured person will be taken to the San Justo Hospital. The man is slightly concussed. The medical team are not worried about the state of his health. Officers spend most of their time in their vehicles, an essential tool for patrol officers that unfortunately are not always in the best shape. Looking at our vehicles, you might have the impression that the government doesn't give us enough funding to keep them running properly. It's very difficult to get new vehicles. Generally, they've been around a long time. We have to maintain them as best we can because our safety depends on it. We heard that we might be getting new vehicles, but we haven't received any yet. Back at the station, a vehicle has caught the officer's eyes. A car with all the latest kit, a prototype that Ali and Martin could only ever dream of having. That's a camera that's constantly filming. 
360 degrees. Can we see what it's filming on there? No, no, these are license plates that it's taken pictures of while moving and while standing still. So we're alerted by a short alarm, and then the screen turns red. And that means the vehicle might have been stolen. Oh, we don't know for sure? We don't know yet? No, we have to check for confirmation. So we call in, they check the system, and then confirm the status of the vehicle, if it's wanted or if it has been stolen. There might be some mistakes with the letters, but we can easily check. Does it take long? No, it just takes a couple of seconds for the system to photograph the plate. It updates it? It updates the database, yes. I think most of the vehicles will be equipped like this by next year. The officers aren't fooled. The police budget goes first and foremost to the elite units. It's unlikely that the two officers will ever get the chance to drive a vehicle like that. If the circumstances look bleak in Argentina, the reality is even worse in the Republic of Haiti. Haiti is one of the 25 poorest nations on the planet. Jacques Mel is the island's cultural capital. The city could have been the country's tourism hotspot. It's got everything. Carnivals and festivals all year long, endless beaches and preserved forests. But the 2010 earthquake devastated over 80% of the city. Today, the city is slowly coming back to life. The seaside resort has definitely got charm. Some tourists still come here, but the country's economy has been bled dry. Its population is in need of everything. In Jacmel, car patrol units try to keep the peace, but their equipment is often on its last legs. The UDMO, the Departmental Law Enforcement Unit, has a tiny budget, and it shows. Yet, Sergeant Amado's men still devote their lives to it. We're in an elite unit. It's a specialized unit. We have two tasks, crowd control and emergency response. We always work in difficult conditions. If you're not courageous, you have no place in our unit. You don't deserve to wear the uniform. Voodoo is the island's predominant religion, and there are celebrations all year long. Throngs of residents line the city streets at every available opportunity to push the reality out of their minds for a short while. But for the UDMO, that's when the problems start. Alcohol abuse can quickly turn the festivities into riots. At Easter, there will be over five days of religious celebrations. Crowds will sing and dance in the streets. But the atmosphere is tense at Jacmel Station. The UDMO officers know that the risk level will go up a notch. Patrol officers will have to make their presence known and monitor the city. The story of the Haitian National Police. We find working on certain operations or dealing with certain circumstances difficult because we don't have the equipment we need. Getting geared up, the officers realize how little they have. For the officers, this means taking additional risks. This is so you don't get hit by rocks. It's a Robocop. It's not a bulletproof vest. That's a helmet, as you can see. It's really in rough shape. There's no visor on this one. We've made requests, but we still haven't received anything. It's really hard for officers to keep peace during violent demonstrations, especially in a country like mine. Insufficient or inappropriate equipment could be the difference between life and death. 
Last month, I lost a colleague, and it was because of our lack of funds. Sergeant Seus tells us about the murder of one of his officers at the beginning of 2016. He was wearing a bulletproof vest and was shot. The bullet made its way through because the vest wasn't very effective. Bulletproof vests have expiry dates, and the one he was wearing had expired. The officers don't have the equipment they need to fight the astonishing crime levels and to reinstate a rule of law in an almost lawless country. The officers' arsenal is made up of 12 caliber rifles, Cougar tear gas grenade launchers, three machine guns, and a few outdated handguns. There are nowhere near enough weapons for the UDMO's 125 officers. Their vehicles bear the marks of their last mission and attest to the violence these officers face. That's a TRM, a French model. The demonstrations, or the demonstrators, are very violent. We had to install this grill because of how violent they are. Can you see? They throw stones at us, even into the vehicle. There's always at least one stone. Can you see? We don't even have a windshield anymore. There's no roof. There's no rear view mirror. There's no light. Finding replacement parts is really difficult. That's why it's in this state. Can you see that one? That one's operational. Back in Argentina, agents Mateo and Zapata have been on patrol for two hours. On the schedule today, patrolling Buenos Aires wholesale market. Here, agricultural products from around the country and from beyond its borders are sold to the city's merchants. The location is an anthill and rife with pickpockets. In terms of security, how's it going at the market? It's a bit like everywhere else. We couldn't catch them this morning. You see someone running, but by the time you see them, it's too late. They've already taken something. It's clear they don't respect the officers, but at least there are more officers now than there used to be. It's safer now, but there are still lots of thefts. Merchants distrust the police. There's one word to explain their hostility, corruption. These two agents are fighting to improve the police's tarnished image. Well, what did you tell me about the police before? They took your money? Yes, before, that's what I said. They stopped me over there and took 300 pesos from me so that you could sell here or just come in? No, they said it's the price of the ticket. The ticket? Yes. They tried to take my money. I told them that I didn't have any money, and they insisted. You've got to pay. So I paid. You have to tell people about that, because we want to stamp out corruption as much as you do. I'm a worker, just like you. I don't like thinking that my colleagues are corrupt. You have to report them. Sergio, a merchant here for over 27 years, shares the officer's opinions. If nine out of 10 people are good and only one is bad, which one will you notice? The one that's bad. And what will people say? That you're all bad. When I'm wearing my uniform, I have a duty to the people because I'm 
Now, how can I say it? I'm the person that they turn to when they have a problem. Yes, when I've got my uniform on, I have a duty to the people. The atmosphere of distrust is hard for young officers to take. Day after day, they work on rebuilding this lost trust. It's a priority for them. We have to get closer to our neighbors, to the citizens. They might not come to us because they're scared or because they don't want to talk about their problems. They're scared, but when we talk directly with people, that changes. And we need it to change so that tomorrow I can rest easy knowing that when my son is at school, he's safe. That's not how I feel now. And with my job, I have a first-hand view of what it's really like. Rocio and Pablo's patrol has come to an end. As night falls over the city, crime doubles. CCTV records violent theft all over the city. Each time, we see armed and determined criminals. So despite their shift coming to an end, the officer's day isn't over yet. We usually do 12-hour shifts. After that, it's changeover. In fact, underpaid, Rocio and Pablo, like most of their colleagues, also work private security, clocking up to 60 extra hours per month. They can work in their police uniform, but if they do, the government taxes them 10% of their income. We adapt in terms of our financial needs and our lifestyles. Sometimes we have so many bills to pay that we need to complement our police salaries with these extra hours. But we've got families. We can't do too much, so we do what we can. We get a level of satisfaction out of this job because we can help people. When people can't get help from anyone else, they call us and we respond. We chose this life. No one forced us into it. I don't think that you can force someone to do a job. I think that we all enjoy some aspect of it, and that's why we stay on the force. That's why we're here. At Jack Mel Station, the team is getting ready to set up road checkpoints. The population will triple during the Easter festivities, so will crime levels. Ah, là où il y a du ah, when there's alcohol involved, anything can happen. The tension can peak at any moment. As you know, the police are there to stop crime. Crime suppression comes after that. That is why we've called you here tonight, so that we can make sure we're visible in the streets through the actions we're going to take tonight. Even though many of us or our families have been victims of crime, we cannot let that affect our work. Work hard, be safe, be vigilant. Thank you. In Haiti, most riots and murders take place at night. The lack of street lighting and the lack of police officers create opportunities for all kinds of criminals. You see, we use the flashlights on our cell phones at work. We don't even have proper flashlights. Good evening. Do you know what you did wrong? No, I don't know. I would like you to tell me what you think I did wrong. The checks are going well tonight, but there are still some tense moments. The police enforce the law, and criminals always try and find a way to bend the rules. 
The lane I have to take is blocked, and you just told me it's not my lane. Sergeant Seus has to be patient and diplomatic to avoid arguing with this man who refuses to admit he was in the wrong. Sir, are you aware of the way you're speaking to us? No, but you can't give me a ticket. I've done nothing wrong. You can't wrong. speak to a UDMO officer like that. Negotiation, resolution, and patience are essential qualities in a police officer. They cannot let incidents escalate. Here in Haiti, escalation could lead to massive risks and the officers aren't willing to let that happen. Sergeant Seus remains resolutely calm. 30 minutes of idle chit-chat won't break the officer. In the end, he raises his voice and the man caves. He'll pay his fine. But the UDMO isn't going to waste time on a traffic offense. The night is long and they've got other things to take care of. Each patrol officer is trained at the Buenos Aires Police Academy. Today, agents Crizzo and Zapata will practice shooting. They find First Lieutenant Recalde, teamed up with Capi. Between them, they've got 50 years of service to the Buenos Aires Police. Being in the presence of such experienced officers isn't a luxury especially in the violent circumstances of this city. You have to understand that if we're training, the criminals are too. We can't lag behind them. They constantly train. Once during a patrol, we were shot at with a machine gun and we only had our 9 millimeter pistols. A pistol's no match for a machine gun. We've seized rifles, foul rifles. They're high caliber. A foul rifle is a military-grade weapon. We don't have 7.62 caliber weapons with a 1,500-meter range. That's the kind of thing that will make it through an armored vehicle, like a knife cutting through butter. The officers really don't have the best material. These are the cartridges we've given them with rubber bullets. They don't really do anything. Okay, fire on the line. There, you can see that these weapons aren't loud enough to intimidate anyone. And they're certainly not going to scare off a crowd facing down two officers. Instructor Ribeiro has a solution, the Versa, an accessory that transforms a handgun into an assault rifle, an effective deterrent. The Versa? The Glock version costs about 32,000 pesos. That's 1,950 euros. It's expensive, but it's not polymer. It's made from ultralight aluminum with a foldable breech. We're facing weapons that can break bones, rip off skin. Even when it comes to weapons, they're better equipped. All the officers remember this CCTV footage. When patrol officers respond to solve an argument between a store owner and two men, one of the criminals pulls out a high caliber gun. He shoots them at point blank range. There are no other words. The officers were executed. Gangs and other criminals don't think twice about shooting officers. Yet the officers are still determined and devoted to accomplishing their mission. How do we do it? By standing together with lots of love for this. Love for the police. 
Many colleagues have fallen doing their duty because of their love and devotion. It hurts. It really hurts to see an officer die. It's not easy because our families wear our uniforms too. When we leave the house, we don't know if we're coming back. Back to their normal day, the agents head to La Paz, a vulnerable neighborhood known for crack trafficking. They've only just arrived when a witness reports a man acting suspiciously. The patrol officers respond immediately. The man seems to be under the effects of drugs. These are the little pipes people tend to use to smoke crack or coca paste. They put the paste there and smoke it like this. When we passed by, a neighbor stopped us and said that two men seemed to be getting ready to do something bad. That's why we've searched here, to try to find a weapon or firearm, something that could give us a clue and confirm what the witness said. The search comes up empty and they have to let the men go. The witness wasn't reliable, but the officers have to check any information they receive. In these vulnerable areas, the officers are all alone. If they feel they are truly at risk, there's only one option their anti-panic button that alerts all officers in the area. It works. In moments when we don't have any radio contact, it's a way of letting the base know that we're in danger. But it's only for emergency situations. We don't have to use it if we have portable radios and a direct line. But if we need it, it's effective. In Haiti, Commander Rosette is getting checkpoints ready around the city. There will be as many as they can man, but there definitely won't be enough. However, that doesn't affect the officer's morale. Good evening. Good evening. This is a checkpoint. Can I please see your driver's license and registration? Vigilance is of the utmost importance during the checks. Her bulletproof vest won't protect her, and she knows it. Sometimes when we check vehicles, we might find unauthorized items in the car, such as guns or other weapons. And the driver might try to run. They receive intel. In Sergeant Seuss's section, a driver refused to have his car checked and plowed through the barrier. He's on the run. The officers have to arrest him as soon as possible. The sergeant's unit tries to catch him. The criminal is lightly armed. It's tense. But this car chase will come to a standstill. A parade is blocking the street. There's no way the officers will risk injuring civilians. Yeah, we missed him. It happens sometimes, even in the best families. He fled and we lost him. The police have a saying, time always works in the police's favor. It's sure that some of them know the road. I don't know why he fled. I don't have WhatsApp, I don't have Facebook, I don't have anything at the moment. What happened? All my phones are completely broken. I don't have a phone. They failed. Sergeant Seuss is frustrated. Once again, a lack of funds has brought an operation to an early end. I could have caught him. I could have climbed on a motorbike and caught him. The officers continue their checks. Now, two-wheeled vehicles are the main target. 
In Jacmel, there are more of them than cars, and it seems that there aren't many citizens willing to follow the law of the roads. Roadblocks are a way for officers to check driving licenses and vehicle registration details. A man is using his cell phone flashlight rather than his headlights. The UDMO have a duty to explain why this man is risking his own safety and that of others around him. A little later on, another man is stopped. This time, his documents aren't up to date. The motorbike could have been stolen or might be wanted. The vehicle is seized while they investigate. The driver and his passenger have to come into the station the following day. Tonight, they'll have to rely on their legs. This morning, the police yard is buzzing. The provincial minister of the police has personally come to the station to discuss a cannabis seizure from the day before, Operation Communication. Here you can see the result of an operation led by the province of Buenos Aires Police Force, by the anti-drug and specialized crime units. The work was carried out in another province, in the province of Corrientes. The drugs come from Paraguay. Trucks were transporting them hidden in a load of lumber destined for consumers in the greater Buenos Aires area. The officers watched the scene with respect and a little bit of envy. Honors and journalists are rarely directed towards the officers in these neighborhoods. This was an undercover operation. They weren't wearing uniforms. They needed intelligence and data. It was a long investigation, the type that can last months, even years. There are specialized police units that only deal with drugs. We wouldn't stumble on a case like that by checking vehicles. The officers get back to work, tirelessly patrolling the streets. Suddenly, a vehicle catches their attention. Criminals are really only interested in high-quality vehicles, the type that start quickly. They need them so they can get away from patrol officers who have heavier vehicles. We check them. We search them to make sure they're not carrying weapons. We don't tolerate weapons that could harm police officers. False alarm. The officers end their search. But a little bit later, the officers receive a call. Agents Criso and Zapata will soon face an unusual situation, a situation that's testament to the gap between Argentina's rich and the poor. On one side, a lawyer, shocked to see a horse carrying such a heavy load. On the other side, a man who relies solely on his horse and chariot to make a living. I wanted to file a complaint because I was driving past in my car and I saw a man loading his wagon with stones. The horse mustn't work. It mustn't work like this. It's the law. But he's making it carry so many stones. All the horse's documents and permits are up to date at the station. I've been doing this for 24 years. You cannot work with this horse. Why not? Why can't I work with my horse? There are laws that prevent this kind of thing. It's cruel to make animals work this hard. The two officers are perplexed. They're going to have to apply the law, but they don't want to. The woman has the right to file a complaint, and we'll have to take her to the station to start the process. It's the law, and we have to follow it. There are no animal support services and no welfare program for people who need work, and this causes problems. And I don't think dealing with this stuff should be part of our job. An emergency call is made to Jacmel station. A woman needs help. A man has threatened her life. The patrol unit heads out right away. Every mission could be dangerous. 
Agent Seuss is ready to face any circumstances. That's my mother. He shoved her. No, he didn't really shove me. She's defending him. Where is the man? His house is just there. He said he has weapons and he'll use them. The officers must quickly verify this information. They're on maximum alert. They can't rely on their bulletproof vests. Where is your husband? I don't know. The officers soon get to the bottom of the conflict. The neighbor has been stealing power from the woman's electricity meter and threatened to kill her if she reports him. Did he break this? Yes, he broke that. He breaks everything. You'll have to make a statement so we can arrest him. That's fine with me. Because we haven't found him, he must have escaped. He'll be back. He always comes back, but I've had it with him. He's now officially a wanted man. The victim must inform the police when he returns to his home. It's going to be a busy day. The unit has only just got back to the station when it gets another call. A group of men have erected a barricade on Marigold Street, over 30 kilometers away from the station. They're vandals. There might be victims. It's a risky operation. This time, Commander Rosette's men will bring out the heavy artillery, even though it's past its best. Yeah, we're taking the vehicle out. It's much safer for this kind of operation, more solid, because they'll be throwing stones there. There are barricades. We need a stronger vehicle. The incident is quite far away. Given the state of the roads, night has already fallen when the officers arrive. Not good for them. Be careful. The tension is palpable. The officers order our team to take cover behind the shields. In the distance, demonstrators have blocked the road. The barricade is alight. They've set fire to tires. The reason behind the violence isn't clear, but it seems like a vendetta between two families. It could become very violent. Time is running out. The officers have to intervene and put an end to the conflict. But there are too many of them for the officers to take control. The rioters throw anything they can get their hands on. It's a crisis situation. One of the officers is injured. The UDMO are overwhelmed. Tonight, they'll have to fall back. There are lots of fires, and they're throwing stones. They're throwing stones and bottles. An officer was injured on his forehead and his nose. He's at the hospital. You went in without being able to see anything? It was coming from both sides? This is what happened. The stones were coming at us from left and right. 
Coming from both sides. That's right, from both sides. You know what it's like in that part of town. Tonight, we weren't able to intervene, but we'll go back tomorrow morning. Be ready at 6 a.m. The sun rose over Buenos Aires hours ago. It's a new day for officers Recalde and Capi, two veterans in these neighborhoods. Patrolling these slums is a risky business. Their pistols are loaded, resting on their knees, ready to fire. We do this for our own safety because it's really dangerous here. We call it a hot zone. There are a lot of criminals here and they hang around in back streets where they can hide. They come out, fire, and then head back in. So we have to be vigilant about gunfire. It could come from anywhere, even from some of these building windows. These neighborhoods are known for sheltering the most violent gangs. They act like these areas belong to them. The patrol unit has its sights on a vehicle. The car looks new and has tinted windows. There are enough suspicious elements to search the car. But they're not in a safe area. They're in gang territory. When my partner conducts a search, I go with him for his safety. While he checks the documents, I cover him with my weapon. So I'll be in a shooting position. It's to protect him in case the suspects are hostile, to protect my partner's physical safety. It's a big weapon, so people find it intimidating. That's why it keeps us safe, so my partner can speak calmly with the suspects. The vehicle's clear. 5-5, five, five, that's what we say. During their shift, the officers face all kinds of crime. Their mission is to enforce the law, but it's sometimes hard for them to forget that they're also parents. Show us what you have on you. Look at the ground in front of you, please. I don't have anything. Do you have any drugs with you? No, I was just lighting a cigarette. I smoke cigarettes. You don't have anything in your pockets? What were you doing? We weren't doing anything. What did you throw on the ground there? You know what it is. I'm asking you what it is, and depending on your answer, things might go well for you. So what is it? It's a joint. What's the name of the drug? Marijuana. Good. Stay calm. You can see we haven't been rude with you. We respect you, so you respect us, okay? Do you know what the problem is? I'm a dad, and I don't want my son doing that, smelling like marijuana. And you wouldn't want your children doing it either. Finally, the officers confiscate the drugs and let them go after reprimanding them. The officers in Buenos Aires' mission is to try and protect children. It's not written in their contract, but it's a priority for them. Unfortunately, it's a thankless task, and Martin wishes it wasn't. We live in a society that doesn't really respect the police because of widespread corruption. 
So people lump us all together and don't respect us. This is something Alexandra, Martin, Cristian, Capi, Orocio, and Pablo would like to see change. That's why they still patrol in the poor areas of Buenos Aires, through thick and thin, to change the police's image. I think we all have a calling in life, and mine is being a police officer. Commander Rosette's team is back at the scene of the riot as soon as the sun rises. The violence that took place the night before is clearly visible. In fact, the officers believe the riot was a diversion. The aim was to loot a warehouse. A victim explains what happened. They burnt my house. They burnt my child's car. Where did you hide while this was happening? In this house, in the pharmacy. The house has been completely destroyed by people throwing rocks. Taking advantage of the chaos, looters tried to get into his store. There was large-scale violence here last night. We have merchandise inside. They wanted to take our goods. There were a lot of rioters. We couldn't set a foot outside. The officers have to arrest those responsible, but they're hiding out above, behind rocks. They can't reach them, and there's no way of knowing just how many of them there are. Their main goal is to reopen the road. Civilians, impatient to get back to normal, help the officers restore the status quo. In difficult economic times, it is crucial that goods can make it into the city as soon as possible. The officers try to arrest the rioters again. There are people up there. We couldn't get to them. They could throw stones at any time. They're the ones who set up the barricades. Opposite the officers, there are too many rioters, and they could attack them from all angles. They can't put their lives in danger peace will have to be restored naturally. This confrontation could have been fatal. Luckily, only one civilian was injured. The injured officer is out of the hospital. The damage was mostly material. The incident will be calmly dealt with in an investigation. Being a police officer in 80 means first and foremost completely believing in your mission. Regardless of the means the officers have, being an officer on the island has a different, very specific meaning. I'm proud to be a police officer. It's a job I really enjoy. Especially in a country like this. I'm very, very proud. But it's frustrating. Argentina and the Republic of Haiti are two nations with a shared reality. Despite the lack of police funds, these two countries can count on the motivation and determination of their policemen and police women. These officers fight on the front lines against crime daily. They chose to take on the risks their jobs pose. 
a choice that gave them an essential role to play in society. Their mission is to continue through thick and thin to ensure a safer future for their citizens.